All right, I have 11 o'clock and uh, good morning, everybody. It is uh, March 25th, 2024. It is an absolutely stunningly gorgeous day here in uh, Ithaca, New York. It's uh, bright blue sky, sunshine and crisp snow from the weekend. So it's a really pretty day, much like the background, actually, of, uh, of Joe's uh, pre uh, of, on his uh, Zoom. So my name is Jana Hexter, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to a presentation by Dr. Joe Regenstein on kosher, halal and insects and how do they relate. I'm sure it'll be absolutely fascinating. And if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, there is live transcription available. Um, if you uh, scuttle, uh, scuttle your mouse, you'll be able to uh, choose a uh, transcription if you prefer that for your session. And um, there is a recording being made. It takes us about a week to send the recording out. Um, and I will um, email everybody who's registered um, and the, the, the recording link, and it'll also be available from our, uh, on our website at this link um, in about a week. So next slide, please. Uh, we love your questions. We have two Q&A breaks uh, scheduled in the presentation, um, and uh, it is much easier for us to manage the questions if you can put them in the Q&A. So if you um, put your mouse over the screen and you see that black box that uh, appears in the middle of there there's a box that says q and a and if you could put your questions in there um, it helps me to see um, if there are similar questions i can see which ones have been answered and um, if you have comments you can put that in the chat but if there are questions uh, please put that in um, um, in the in the q a box that would be wonderful and you can also ask questions anonymously there. Um, so uh, there's a little checkbox that you can choose. So, and next slide, please. Great. So it is my delight to uh, welcome our presenter today, Dr. Joe Regenstein, who is a professor emeritus of uh, food science. He is um, a recognized expert on kosher and halal foods. He served on the Food Market Institute's Animal Welfare Technical Committee and serves with Dr. Temple Grandin and others on the American Veterinary Medicine Association's Humane Slaughter Guidelines Panel, with his work focused on the religious slaughter of animals. He's received two awards from uh, Cornell Cal's effort to promote multicultural diversity and an outstanding accomplishments in science and public policy, and has received the Institute of Food Technologists Elizabeth Steyer Humanitarian, Borloo International, and Carl Fellows Career Service Awards, uh, joint with uh, Phi Tau Sigma. He co-founded and edited um, the Institute for Food uh, Technologists, Religious and Ethnic Foods Division newsletter for many years. So you have a wealth of, uh, of expertise uh, 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 presence uh, this morning so to ask your questions and, and learn from, from Dr. Regenstein. Um, so uh, I, with that, I will um, ask, we have a little poll that we can ask a couple of questions for you. Should pop up on your screen. There you go. Actually, just one question we have. And at the end of the presentation, we have a couple of uh, questions for you too. So I'll just give you a minute to answer that. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. We have 87% of people have uh, participated. I know some people must be driving and other things. Um, so, 69% uh, of you have eaten insects and 31% have not. I, I would put myself in the have not category. So, uh, well, not knowingly anyway, I'm sure I have eaten plenty over the years, but uh, but not uh, knowingly. So, so uh, we have a brave group of people. So, all right. Um, and uh, with that, I will ask uh, Dr. Regenstein to move forward. Thank you, Yana, for that lovely introduction. Um, it is certainly my pleasure to speak to the group today, and I realize we have a mixed audience, but um, I also, and they took the, the first question, but again, if you've not eaten insects intentionally, is there a religious or philosophical reason, which relates to obviously today's talk, and if you have not, would you consider eating insects intentionally? Um, and then comes the more detailed and difficult question of which insects would you consider eating? And clearly, not all insects are going to make the cut. And the question can be further fine-tuned into 
you recognize that you're eating it. In other words, you're looking it in the face or um, as is being done in some cases, it's being made into powders or flowers that can be used as an ingredient. And unless you're told, you would not know you're eating it. Anyway, those are some of the things to think about. We'll let you think about them again at the end and we'll probably um, they have a question or formally. So anyway, the official title for my talk, and it is a secular food science perspective. I am not a religiously trained person in either of the two faiths I'm talking about, although um, it, it may become obvious that I am a member of the Jewish faith. Um, I do want to at least point out as a starting point to give the big picture, in addition to the question of eating, we're going to be looking at the question of food, uh, animal feed, but it also, uh, as we will see, uh, will affect how IPM needs to treat products that are destined for some of these markets. So, for example, um, and we'll do it in a little more detail, um, there are issues with IPM in terms of the religious community. They're not 100% on board. And one needs to understand that. And the other thing for almost everybody is we use food as a wonderful way to bring people together. But if that food is inappropriate and there is nothing for people of the Muslim or Jewish faith or any other faith that has food laws, then the bringing of people together becomes very divisive and leads to them feeling left out. So again, those are two places where folks who come in from the IPM and folks coming in generally need to think about these things. As a way to approach this, um, I usually try to start with a very brief introduction. And given the nature of the topic, it will be particularly brief um, in terms of what we are talking about at the 30,000 foot level, and I will give you a reference at the end to a paper that kind of fills it in at least down to the 5,000 foot level, gives you something uh, a little more available. It's, it's an open access manuscript, and you can also request it from me directly. Um, kosher means fit or proper. Halal means lawful. They are both legal systems, and what makes them different from what most people think of when they think of religion is that they are religions of law, and the kinds of things we're talking about today are the legal aspects of these religions. It is not philosophical or broad. It is very focused on specific laws. A most important initial statement is kosher and halal foods are not blessed. There is nothing specifically making them holy other than they follow the rules. And that's exactly the point. It is following these rules so that the rabbi or imam is there to provide a third party audit to assure that the product is following the rules. And then telling people who believe him or her that in fact, these rules have been followed. And that is the crux of kosher and halal. The one exception is the blessing at the time of slaughter. And for Muslims, it's over each individual animal. And for Jews, it's over a batch of animals. So when the slaughterman goes out, he'll say the prayer once, do a group of animals. That's the only time something is blessed. And that's because one is taking the life of a sentient being. So what are these laws? They cover a, a bunch of areas. The first one is the allowed animals and, and the concept of what animals can one use for kosher is and halal are the critical issues. Again, I've listed them here. It's fairly narrow for kosher. It's a little more broad for halal. You will notice that the major animal that is not on either of these lists is the pig. And for both religions, the pig is 
uniquely singled out in halal, very much within the religious texts, in kosher as one of a number of animals that are unacceptable, but in practical terms, in terms of commercial importance, the p absence of the pig is the big one. The birds are, are limited to a list that is a little bit difficult at times to ascertain, but clearly um, things like ostriches are not included. Well, for Muslims, the ostrich is uh, included. Both, again, uh, avoid any animal that's normally associated with um, hunting or using their claws in the case of fish to um, capture animals. Kosher with respect to fish is fish with fins and removable scales. And that means you can scrape them off, which is why I show one of my fish ties. Halal, it's all animals that spend their entire life in the water. But many Muslim groups, um, schools within the different sects, um, have more strict requirements. And some even go as far as only taking fish with fins and removable scales. So there's a range, but there are also animals that, again, are outside of that. And before I get to the insects, I want to at least introduce two words that are important in Islam, which is tayab, which is wholesome. So tayab is good. Najis means filth and includes components of animals and many other things. And so as we discuss insects, we are going to use those two terms. So uh, this is the slide I don't use all the time because we usually don't drill down to insects. Essentially, there are certain locusts that are accepted. If you go back into Hebrew scripture, uh, first five books, which are called the Torah, you will see mention of an animal that is described twice in the first five books of Moses, and that has been translated to be specific locust, for which, in fact, there needs to be a tradition of using them. Halal allows for beneficial insects that are not considered as najis. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did in fact locust. So again, locust, everybody in both communities, at least certain types of locust are reasonably comfortable. The question then is what happens um, with deciding which ones are tayab and which ones are najis in an area that generally the Muslim clerics and scholars have not gone before, and that's part of the problem. There isn't a long history of evaluating various insects and related creatures for human or animal feed use. Now, when it comes to feed for animals, kosher, there are no rules except for Jews feeding their own animals, which is no mixing of milk and meat of kosher species. Again, beyond what we need to focus on, the key here is that the feed used commercially for animal feed of, would not be subject to the kosher laws. How, and they will be respond, reflected in the halal, but let's go a little bit further before coming back to that. The way of slaughter becomes very important. Animals are slaughtered with a norm, normative standard is made unconscious by a cut across the neck. Halal, in terms of slaughter, that's it. Kosher, there's a whole process after that that I don't want to go in great detail. But the important point for both communities is that animal products coming from ruminants or mammals more broadly and or birds must 
first come from an animal that has been religiously slaughtered. So many ingredients that we use in foods and may use in reactors to make products would have to come from either a non-animal source or a source that had religious slaughter. And again, there are other laws in Judaism, we already referred to it, the separation of milk and meat, um, which is a very complex and subject way beyond today's talk. And then there is Passover, which is a holiday we're about to celebrate in less than a month, which is a week of eating unleavened bread, which means that it in fact invokes patience on the plant side, in addition to all the rules we use all year round. And in, most, in, in halal, many of you may be aware that there is also a prohibition of beverage alcohol, in particular eth ethanol, ethyl alcohol. Um, and a key in the business world, in the real world, is making equipment acceptable for kosher and or halal. One can take a plant and make products that are kosher and halal in a plant that originally wasn't kosher and halal. And there is some degree of being going able to go back and forth, consistent with certain rules of both religions. So that is the broad it part of kosher. Before I jump into the meat of this, um, we thought we would take a, a quick break and see if there are any Q&A or um, comments in the chat box. Um, and I'm looking for- Great. Wonderful. That really was a 36,000 mile view. So thank you. Um, we don't have any questions, although sometimes uh, people will type them as I am speaking. But we do have a comment actually from Joseph Yoon which you may be interested in. He said, um, Insects to Feed the World Conference will be held in a halal conference center in Singapore, and they're navigating the regulatory and religious issues for approval. So this subject of, is of great interest. And he also placed the link, if anyone is interested in that, or uh, for Dr. Regenstein uh, later. So, uh, so it's perfect timing for, for uh, conference planners. So Thank you. And I think that's a, a good start in help helping the Muslim community to address this issue. Um, again, as I said, these are new issues and different scholars and religious leaders are going to come up with slightly different points of view and it will take some time to sort. And it may never, and there may be certain groups within Islam that will accept a particular insect and others who won't. Um, that remains to be seen. Anyway, thank you, and I'll continue. And again, if you have a question, we can come back to it. Okay. Now we want to really jump into insects. Except for specific locusts, which we talked about, and it has requires a tradition of eating, which means passing on from generation to generation, all such ins other insects are not kosher. As a practical matter, there are a few communities in the Middle East that continue to have the acceptance of locusts, there is even a, a real question if normative mainstream Judaism in this country and in Europe will actually accept even locusts. Um, we know there are Jews who eat locusts and they are kosher for them, but that does not mean it's kosher for everyone. So insects are defined, and stick with me here, from a kosher point of view, an insect must, in terms of what you're eating, must be whole, must be visible. So an insect that is too small to see um, is not an issue, and it must come from someplace else. And that definition of, a, of, of what's sort of naturally there it's very complicated and it's probably not going to be used in any way to make insects acceptable. Um, the visible and whole are important. So 
when one looks at the FDA standards for insects, it's insect parts. Um, but what's important here is to recognize that the Jewish community in terms of the edible part of a food has detailed procedures for removing visible insects. There are washing procedures, there are the use of light boxes, there is the training of people to recognize aphids and thrips and other small but visible insects. And when you go to a restaurant that is kosher, the religious supervisor is often spent, spends a lot of his or her time inspecting vegetables for in, and fruits for insects. There is a desire for zero tolerance for insects and similar small organisms that meet that definition of visible and whole on foods that are eaten. If one intends and purchases food to make, for example, cream of broccoli soup, um, one does not need to do the inspection. The assumption is the pureeing will no longer meet whole and that the amount of insect infestation can be nullified by a volume calculation that gets to be complicated, but um, is de facto used at times. And it is interesting in modern times, the rabbis have, at least in this country, accepted a degree of statistical sampling. So if you have a case of cabbage, for example, and you're looking for thrips, you are allowed to sample three heads out of a dozen heads. And if none of the three heads has any thrips, for example, then you are able to accept the whole lot without having to do some inspection of some of the other samples. Um, usually for something like cabbage, they'll go through the, about 10 leaves on the, on the outside of the thing working their way in. So it's a very serious inspection and therefore they take this very seriously. And so they don't want insects. Um, some other insect related issues in the terms of growing and using and becoming kosher is honey is accepted as a processed plant material. It's how the rabbis have accepted honey. Some would argue that that's to make the land of milk and honey acceptable, but um, honey is probably honey from dates. There is something called date honey, and that is um, what probably was known about more in the in the Middle East. Black resin, which is often referred to as shellac, is an edible product until it's made into a, put into a solvent that is unsafe for use for painting or fixing furniture. It is an exudate from the lac bug and therefore the bug can be separated out from the resin and is generally accepted. Cochineal or carmine, which is the red color, one of the natural red colors, is generally not acceptable because in producing it, one is actually extracting it from the shell of the insect that contains the color and that is generally not accepted. It is not normatively accepted, though there are some Orthodox rabbis on the more lenient side who will accept it. So you will occasionally see products with cochineal or carmine, carmine that have some form of kosher certification. Again, not normative, not accepted in the mainstream. So a few quick stories just to show you how important this is, is there are, of course, thrips in cabbage. And thankfully, uh, research at Cornell showed that when you make sauerkraut, the thrips fall off naturally. So um, when the rabbis became aware of thrips in cabbage, they were ready to 
band Sauerkraut, and um, we visited with them with folks from Geneva, uh, the experiment station up in Geneva for Cornell, and we were able to convince them that all the thrips are in the drainage water and sauerkraut's fine. Brussels sprouts are an interesting product. The whole Brussels sprout is considered not kosher. There's no way you can expect a Brussels sprout and still have a Brussels sprout. Now, as we've moved to Brussels sprout halves and we've moved to Brussels sprout leaves in the marketplace, those can be inspected and therefore those can be found uh, as kosher certified. And um, at one point I actually did an, a project on aphids in broccoli. Um, we got some organic broccoli and I would say that uh, folks who were eating that particular batch of broccoli were getting a lot of their protein from aphids. And I suspect all of us in reality have, unless when are keeping strict kosher, um, have um, had various insects as part of the food. Aphids attach themselves very tightly to the food. It is very hard to remove them. In general, um, broccoli is not served at kosher events unless it has been specifically inspected um, and handled and packaged in a sealed package. So you have, and this is the crux of the IPM piece of this, the rabbis like pesticides. They want the edible portion to be free of insects. So um, some of the IPM activities where we accept small amounts of insects, and I have no problem with that conceptually as a food scientist, but I do recognize that that is in conflict with some basic thinking in the IPM world, which is to allow a certain amount of insect damage, which generally means allowing a certain amount of insects. Okay, now to get more specific about halal. The range of insects that are tayab is not well established. Locusts have clearly been established. Some of the scholars and religious leaders, as I understand it, have accepted cricket. But after that, it's not clear that some of the other insects that are being used at this point are have been adjudicated. So we are in the position which, for example, hopefully the Singapore conference will actually address where the question of what is acceptable and why is it more important in the Muslim community? Because the Muslim community defines it as tayab, if it's acceptable, and it's najis if it's not. And the problem that makes this unique to halal and not kosher, is nudges should not be intentionally fed to animals. We all recognize that when animals eat grass in the field, as most of the halal animals are ruminants and are pasture-eating animals, they're going to get insects, and that is not a concern. But if you're intentionally feeding filth and certain insects are defined by Muslim scholars and, and religious leaders as not just filth, they cannot be used for feeding animals and there will be pushback as there was for other feed usage, one that caused problems for more people and was rejected beyond just its halal is this question of feeding manures back to animals. That is clearly not just and certainly not acceptable for halal. And as the halal Muslim community is finding its place in the world food system, we are seeing more attention to what is actually fed to the animals. 
So bringing in new insect feed technology into the Muslim world is probably going to be paid attention to and therefore only accepted for those insects that the community considers to be tayyab and not nodges. So there is this important issue to deal with. So again, just a, as a broader summary, I keep referring to kosher and halal. They are extremely important in the food industry. A quarter of the world's population is Muslim. And even more folks live in countries that function with some degree of Muslim law. So in fact, they also will be eating halal most of the time. And kosher in the U.S., 40% of our manufactured foods are kosher. And when you look at some mixed factories that are using kosher and non-kosher products coming out of the same factory, you will find that the rabbis often insist that the ingredients in the plant that are used on the kosher side have to be kosher even if used on the non-kosher side so that if somebody runs out of something they're not going to grab the non-kosher version so there's even more of the total ingredient pool is kosher so these are business activities um and they're one goes kosher halal one sells into the kosher halal market if one's a grower one has some opportunities for some specialized low insect product. Uh, and there are farms that are doing this, that they are raising and, and taking some of the crop. Often it's the earliest crop in the area, and that has a much lower chance of, of having insects. Some of the fresh salad makers have worked very hard to make sure their processes are insect free. And when they're successful, they can have religious certification. And they want it for both religious certification. And because once we go into packaged salads, the consumer doesn't want to find an insect. It is now an industrial product. A company has its name on it. It doesn't want the insects either. So again, these are decisions that people make in the business world. Um, also want to talk a little bit about a few other groups just to remind folks that there are many groups that are vegetarian and vegan. Um, it is not clear um, how they will react to insects being used in certain applications. Now, again, if they're vegan, they're should have no reason to be eating anything that might have had been fed insects, but vegetarians might can be concerned if the chicken or the cow um, is eating something that they consider uh, unacceptable. Um, on the other hand, we are seeing an increase in the use of insects and certainly to the extent that they, it's controlled and made um, available to consumers who are willing, it will have a positive effect on the food supply. And some of you I know specialize in the organic market, and I would raise the issue of are organic consumers, particularly those who are like vegetarian, comfortable eating insects that are on the product. And that remains to be seen how that will play out. Uh, a funny place where it affected fruits and vegetables was the coatings that give it the shine. That's where the shellac is often used, uh, waxes are used, but it turned out at some point the industry started using animal products and that was causing problems either animal products from animals that were not slaughtered kosher or halal, 
or for kosher specifically, dairy products, which meant that the fruit, which would normally be neutral, which we use the word par for, was no longer acceptable with a meat meal. So um, if, if you're coating something with a dairy product, you can't use it in a meat stew. And obviously chitin, which comes from both shellfish, which are prohibited in kosher, mixed reaction in Muslim halal, but certainly if it's coming from an insect chitin, what is its status? So um, I worked for seven years with the supermarkets and chain restaurants um, to look at these waxes, worked with the FDA, which in the Nutritional Labeling and Education Act actually um, indicates that um, a sign is required on the information on the shipping carton and a general sign uh, in the supermarket is required. Doesn't mean that all the supermarkets do it, but as you can see on the list at the bottom of this um, picture that I took in a Whole Foods, uh, a number of fruits and vegetables are coated with waxes. Now, the industry has basically gotten rid of use of any animal products. And you can see from the type of produce wax plants, they do have insects. But now in both cases, I believe that both Muslims and Jews are okay with those materials. And then some of them are synthetic in those uh, in both cases. And th this is the kind of plain English language required because looking at some of these wax formulations, there's a lot of organic chemistry involved, names involved, and even though they're perfectly fine, they aren't helpful in determining their source. And that's one of the problems with food labels for Muslims and Jews. The ingredient label is not focused on the source, it's focused on the ingredient, and that causes problems. GMOs are another area where um, the use of potentially using microbes and um, sex sources will be an issue. Can one use an insect gene? Can one transfer a gene into an insect so that it makes an edible or product for use by humans? And again, in all of these situations, the key for kosher is that the gene transfer is irrelevant. It's microscopic and therefore it's not a problem. But the reactor that is used and all the ingredients have to be acceptable. On the other hand, for Muslims, it appears that they will not accept a gene that comes from an animal that is not halal. That is not finalized. There is still discussion going on, but it appears quite clear to me that the thinking is moving in the direction that any gene obtained from a non-halal animal will not be accepted. Um, certainly if it comes from a nodgeous animal. So again, um, as people work into some of the newer, fancier technology, they're going to have to pay attention to some of these issues. Um, again, they, this nauseous issue, haram issue, has to be considered. Um, the point I want to make just to clarify, this is not about kosher and halal, but about vegetarian and vegan, those claims can be made without a concern for the equipment being used. And it is clear that these products are not intensely checked for insects. So um, what is vegan or vegetarian 
is probably at times not acceptable for kosher and halal for those who are following the full points. The same goes for the issue of fungal material. Are they going to be considered nodges? Are they considered nodges if they're raised on manure, which is often used for this purpose, at least uh, in Pennsylvania for the traditional standard mushroom? Um, to date, Muslims have not paid attention to this, but it is an issue that uh, as they are learning more about the food supply and developing their inspection systems, these issues may come up. Um, another issue that struck me as I watched and as somebody who has composted plate waste, meaning food that comes from the dining hall after people have eaten, um, is being proposed as a raw material for feeding insects, which in my mind makes lots of sense. But the question is, is that going to be defined as nodges? So even if you grew locust on plate waste, the locust in that case would be nodges or haram. So again, one needs to pay attention to the details in terms of serving these communities. Anyway, that is kind of a broad, quick look at how insects might play out in various aspects of the food system. Uh, as I said, there's this paper that's available online at ift.org that is a comprehensive review of kosher and halal. And I might as well make a quick plug for a two credit course that's taught completely by distance learning at Kansas State University by yours truly. And so um, I'm now open to questions on the second part of the talk, either again, through the Q&A function or through the mm -hmm. um, chat, chat, if anyone yeah. makes a comment. Wonderful. We actually have quite a few questions and, uh, and comments that kind of tie together. So, um, but Natalie uh, Tessicini, um, could you uh, maybe put your question in again? I'm not sure I fully understand it, and and um, and uh, and uh, we can come back to that. Um, um, and so there's some really interesting questions. So one is um, a couple of comments and a question about locust. So uh, Joseph Yoon said there's a kosher certified locust farm in Israel, and he gave a link. And then Gideon Van, Van Abden said it's important to note that each and every kosher certifying agency has its own rules, including about how vegetables should be inspected. Not all banned Brussels sprouts and broccoli. And then uh, Deb Grantham had asked, could you clarify me, um, are locusts not kosher or are they uh, are they only kosher insect? So there was a little, there's, there's some questions about about um, about locusts and, and kosher. So maybe could you just uh, expand? Sure. Um, locusts, certain species that have certain characteristics were historically accepted. In particular, for example, the Yemenite Jewish community continues to use locust, and they have passed on the skill of identifying what are the kosher locust from generation to generation. And so they have a history, an unbroken history of eating locust. And there's no question that it's acceptable for them to eat locust in the Middle East. Everyone else has lost that tradition. It has been literally hundreds of years since most Jewish communities have ever tried to eat locust. And so in theory, they have lost the tradition of eating locust. There are two questions that then arise with this disparity. One is the question, if one is visiting a Yemenite Jew who has that tradition, does one who is very strictly kosher accept the food or not? And there are long discussions, um, and there are rabbis who argue both ways, that if 
one of us from European Jewry went to Yemen. Should we or should we not eat the locusts that the Yemenites are eating routinely? The other question is, if can we bring a Yemenite Jew to America and have him or her identify which of our locusts are kosher? And that there seems to be pretty uniform agreement, though maybe not 100% because there rarely is, that that is not permitted. So as a practical matter, the question of kosher locust is restricted to those of what are called the Sephardic community, those who've lived mainly in the Middle East and North Africa. And that is the dominant population in Israel. So they probably have more flexibility. So grazing locust in Israel, there is probably a sufficient community to accept it, but there is also going to be a community that's going to reject it, which is the European expats living in Israel who are Orthodox will probably not accept the locust. Hope that clarifies it. It is a longer answer. Uh, but Great. hopefully clear. Great. And there's a follow-up question actually related to this. Uh, Louise uh, Bugby said, forgive my ignorance, but why exactly are insects forbidden? From the kosher, I can answer more clearly, which is God said you do. They're called hukim. There are collect. We do not try to explain the kosher laws. They are listed clearly in both Leviticus and Deuteronomy. In the first five books, it says, thou shalt and thou shalt not. It is a commandment. And God lists which animals, the characteristics of animals you can eat and the animals that are prohibited. And in the animals below fish, in the lower animals, there is this subscription of something they would jumping legs, etc., which all of the rabbis have interpreted to be a description of grasshopper or locust. And therefore, those were considered acceptable. And there is a tradition of what constitutes an acceptable locust. Not all locusts are acceptable. And I mean, I had a rabbi of, probably now about 10 years ago who is in Israel who pays a lot of attention to these issues. And there had been a locust plague coming in from Africa, crossing the Middle East. And he sent me the pictures of these locusts. And he said, these are kosher locusts for those who will eat locusts. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Richard Pollack has asked, um, if a whole insect is visible in food, but that then is removed, such as extracting and disposing um, a whole flower beetle from a loaf of bread, does that make the food item acceptable? If the insects are properly removed, they the remaining food product is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, great. And then uh, Natalie uh, Tashini, she had, I'm gonna read her three, three comments. So the first question, which I asked her to clarify a little was, Maybe you will talk about how this might relate to store pro store product pests. And then she said, stored products like grains might have insects or parts, but you can't um, exactly use pesticides on them. So my question is about the acceptable amount of insect parts and how those items are considered to be kosher or not. Um, she said, this topic is extremely interesting and thank you. It's uh, so interesting to see how these conversations evolve in religious community as our world evolves. One of the things every Jew, Orthodox Jew, or kosher observant household is asked to do is whenever one takes out the flour or the rice or the other grains, one is supposed to lay them out and look for insects. And if there's insects, if you are willing to remove them, you remove them. If not, you cannot use the product. So yes, we know that certain products have the insects visible after the fact. And so um, 
that would make them non-kosher unless you do the separation. Yeah. So yes, you have to deal with it. And generally speaking, given the reality, if, if you've got a bug infested bag of flour, you're gonna throw it out, which probably most everybody else would do also. But you in the kosher home specifically cannot use that until all the bugs are removed. Again, you can use if if you've got a very fine sifter. Um, for certain bugs, the sifting is acceptable. Yep, great. And um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, um, so Richard Pollack has asked, I've heard that meat produced in vitro, even from pigs, may be acceptable. What are your thoughts? Would that extend to products resulting from insect cell culture? That one is going to take some adjudication. I know that at this point, we're seeing some of the cell culture issues are literally, the rabbis have taken the extreme opposite end in some cases. The Orthodox Union is taking, which is the largest certifier in the US, is taking a very strict approach that it has to come from a slaughtered animal that is kosher. Um, the chief rabbi of Israel um, has accepted um, be, uh, the beef product from a biopsy of a live animal and claimed it is no longer meat. Um, nobody has adjudicated on the kind of questions that Richard is, is asking. Um, my guess is they're going to draw the line somewhere, and I doubt that meat from non-kosher animals are going to be acceptable. Clearly, the issue of the pig is that has come up a little bit. So far, I don't see any likelihood of it being accepted in either community. All right. And... Um, uh, I maybe two two little questions. One is, well, maybe not little. Um, Deb Braganthrama asked, are all brassicas non-kosher, um, same species of plant, so, since you mentioned broccoli? Plant itself is not, is kosher. All plants are kosher, pretty much. I don't, the only, the only plant that has special rules during the normal part of the year is grapes. There's a whole world of grapes and wine and idolatry, et cetera. All these products are kosher. The question is, what is the level of insect infestation and therefore how and what parts can you use either with checking for insects or not? And again, the, for example, on the Brussels sprouts, the issue, Brussels sprouts are kosher, but you, if you want a whole Brussels sprout, you can't do the inspection because the insects are on the inside. You can't get in there without destroying it. Mm -hmm. So as a practical matter, you can open it up and use the broccoli perfectly well, but you are limited on to being able to properly inspect it. All right, lovely, thank you. Well, I will move on because we have a few um, things to, to slides before we end and, uh, and um, so we should see a poll pop up with some questions and there is also some, yeah, there we go. And well, here's the poll questions. Right, there you go, some poll questions. Okay, 83% of you have had time to answer. So I'm gonna share the results uh, with you. There we go. Um, so 84% would consider eating insects in the future and, um, and as a result of this webinar, do you see how kosher, halal, and IPM relate? And there's 98% of people said yes on that, and which is, I'm sure, music to uh, Dr. Regenstein's ears. And, um, and as a result of this webinar, if it's relevant, how likely are you to increase your implementation of IPM? And uh, so we have quite a few in the moderately very and extremely likely, which is what we like to see. So thank you very much for, uh, for taking that poll. And uh, and then these same questions that we started out with, and I don't know if you 
maybe just want to, to okay so um upcoming webinars um in a couple of weeks so three weeks i think we have a presentation on reducing synthetical chemical use to optimize press management and crop production a case study of onion thrips um in onion and uh, there's some very interesting results uh that have come out of that so if any of you are vegetable or onion growers uh, i think it'll be an interesting webinar and uh, we also will have more webinars in the fall, and uh, we tend to we tend to do them in the in sort of winter and fall, so we don't um, bump into the growing season too much. So yeah, keep an eye out for uh, things coming up in the fall. And next slide. Uh, okay. Oh, this actually might be a particular interest to the people on this uh, webinar. So we have a place on our website called Find a Colleague. If you're interested in connecting with colleagues with a similar interest in IPM, you can post a profile about yourself at the, the link in the first box and say who you are and what you're interested in collaborating on. And then um, you can also peruse our site and see who's posted. So for example, Dr. Regenstein may have a profile and said he's you know, interested in kosher and halal and IPM and um, and you may be a grower who might be interested in participating in some research um, or um, so there's so it's it's actually a great way of connecting with each other across the northeast for people who have particular interests and uh, so I encourage you to uh, to go check that out and uh, next slide please there will be a recording of this and I'll send you a link in about a week and uh, you can watch it as often as you like on our website. And next slide. And I want to uh, take some time to acknowledge that the Northeastern IPM Center is based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee Confederacy an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And this land acknowledgement has been reviewed and approved by the traditional Gayakono leadership. And uh, next slide, please. We also want to acknowledge that, uh, especially this time of year when you're preparing your taxes, that uh, we, the Northeastern IPM Center is funded by uh, through the USDA, uh, NIPA, and uh, with a grant. And uh, none of this would be possible without uh, funding from them. And I'm sure a lot of uh, Dr. Regenstein's work over the decades has been funded by, uh, by federal grants as well. So, um, so I think that may be the last slide, unless there's another one. No, okay. In that case, I want to say thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Regenstein. This was just fascinating, and I'm sure it was very helpful to uh, to people. And uh, it's an unusual topic, and uh, thank you for your dedication over the years to be able to uh, give us this wonderful presentation. It's much appreciated. My pleasure to work with you, and it's been fun to do, and I people should feel free to contact me by email preferably uh, if they have any follow-up questions or comments or want to explore things beyond that yeah ex excellent and we also when we put up the recording there'll be a copy of the slide set for people they can look at the slides in your email be on there they could look through cornell and find you pretty easily so so wonderful well thank you very very much and it looks like from the from the comments that it was much appreciated. So a great way to start a beautiful sunny Monday morning. So I hope everyone has a wonderful week.